Hi, I'm Sarah Betcher. I'm an Alaskan ethnographic filmmaker and owner of Farthest North Films. For the last couple years, I've been working as the filmmaker for Sustainable Futures North, based primarily at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, a project that explores interactions among food, water, energy security, and community sustainability. I directed, filmed, and edited Tied to the Land, Voices from Northwest Alaska. This six-part film series showcases how 10 Northwest Alaskan villages are seeking ways of adapting to rapid changes in climate, weather, and development. You will be immersed into the daily lives of active hunters, fishers, and gatherers by air, land, and sea. And I hope you enjoy watching Tied to the Land film series. We have the gift of resources in this borough. As we develop the non-renewable resources, we need to ensure that the renewable resources continue to thrive. The borough is in a growth time. Is there a way that we can have our coastal communities of Alaska benefit from this? Is there cheaper energy to be had? We are beginning to develop renewable resources for energy. Here in Kotzebue, for quite a few years now, we've been using wind. Buckland and Deering will be getting wind in the next couple of years. All of our water treatment plants have solar to help them cut the cost of heating those water plants. We're getting to the point of using more renewable resources and we're looking at ways to get this to help us. We're struggling with this concept of economic development and maintaining an environmental security as well. About 30 years ago, Nana Regional Corporation had selected some highly mineralized areas, which included the Red Dog Mine. Almost 60% of the workforce at the Red Dog Mine is made up of Nana shareholders. For those people who are working at the Red Dog Mine, they can afford to buy their gas, they can afford to heat their homes. Red Dog helped me out with my financial needs. I worked 15 years at Red Dog, two on and one week off, and kind of hard to stay away from home, all right, but we need to pay bills and stuff like that. They can afford the implements that it takes to continue to subsist to help the community. I worked at Red Dog about three quarters of the year for 16 years. I have a Honda four-wheeler. For winter travel, I have three snow machines. So the impacts of a job, of two jobs, becomes really important because of the impact that it has on the whole community and how food sharing works. Because I know a very few subsistence hunters who only hunt for themselves. Work full time, trap full time, commercial fish full time, and hunted full time and ended my career with uh, being a borough mayor for six, six years. The economy here, it's called a mixed cash and subsistence economy. A lot of people rely on subsistence to take care of our meat needs and that's an expensive item there. I would rather live off the land than going over to the store and buy a $20, $30 or even a $50 roast. Living in a village is pretty expensive. I can see that there's always going to be a shortage of cash. People are never going to be able to earn enough money. Expenses are always going to be going up every year. In this borough, there are no economics. There's no economy. Very few jobs. Nana Regional Corporation has some jobs. Manila has some jobs. The airlines have their people. And education, a little bit of health care. And that's about it. And how are people to live? And are we going to experience out-migration in the absence of economies? 
for us trying to spur the economic development here is to put folks to work to you know to build a sustainable economy here one of the biggest things that we're facing out here in Norvik jobs and housing last summer we were able to put about 27 residents to work that was the most jobs that had been around the community in quite a few years one of our underlying challenges that goes so unnoticed in this area. We have an extreme housing shortage and then all of the associated ramifications of overcrowding. It impacts kids, it impacts the family, it impacts the community, it impacts the school. A lot of folks left the community because they just did not have a place to stay. And they have families here that have two, three families per household, and that's 10, 12 people in a three bedroom home. With housing, they move away and they don't come back because there's nowhere to live. So another goal that we've been working on here recently is to try and provide some housing here in the community. To bring in 20 homes would be about a $3.5 million investment in our community. It can be done. Talking to the powers that be that can make the decisions to do the things we need done here. We need economic opportunity as well. Whether it's going out to hunt and fish or going to the store or paying for your internet and paying for your cell phone. What's important to the Northwest Arctic Borough is to achieve balance between what's important to us based on the values that we have, continuing to rely on the environment for the things that it provides us, and balancing that with being able to have some economic opportunity because in, in today's world that's a necessity. The paradigm has shifted. You have to have a job to afford your gas and your shells and your gun and your tent or your home at camp. So you have to work for like an eight to five job to uh, afford to stay at camp in the country to harvest the food, the animals. So a lot of us, we go take subsistence leave for like two weeks at a time versus seasons at a time. It's extremely expensive now. It'll cost anywhere from 200 bucks or so just for gas to stay at camp. I love the lifestyle. It's uh, getting out and in the country, but I'm a working single mother. Nowadays, because a lot of us work or raising our families to do subsistence, it takes a lot of time. And when you're a working mother, you have to just do what you can to get all the food that you need. Subsistence is a very important thing in our lives and we wish we could do it more often but gotta have work and pay bills and... I take care of the airport during the winter. That's our life lying out of the spillage. There's a lot arriving on our plate that's related to Arctic development. It causes a lot of concern. Just think of what it would be like if they had a oil spill from up in the Chuck GC. Think how far it would spread before they got to it. With the ice traveling at nine, ten miles an hour, and they have ice almost a football field along, and you mean to tell me your structure will be able to stop that? We said, we have good concrete. I said, well, I wish we'd bring it to our villages so we could put it on our roads and our airfields. The whole thought of developing some of our oil resources in a very fragile environment. If there's ever an oil spill, how are they going to go underneath the ice and start trying to get that oil? It's going to wipe out crustaceans, the shrimp, crabs, clams, those bottom feeders, fish, seals. If ever happens, I mean, we're going to be hurting. We as Inupiaq people have this concern about making sure that our marine food sources are secure. And we have to be very conscious that every decision we make has a consequence.